Welcome to Field Sports Britain. I'm Charlotte Reetha, but everyone calls me Charlie too. This week we have an exclusive interview with Alice Barnard, the new chief executive of the Countryside Alliance. At just 33, Alice is the youngest appointed chief executive of the Countryside Alliance since it was formed in 1997. A rider since childhood, she was also master of the Cambridge University Drag Hands and she's worked for the Countryside Alliance for over three years. With 100,000 members, the Countryside Alliance is Europe's largest lobby group on rural affairs. Alice, with only three years experience as a regional director um, for the East Midlands, chief executive's quite a leap. Are you the right person for the job? Well, absolutely. I think I provide the enthusiasm and the vision the Alliance needs to drive forward in the 21st century. And actually, over the last three and a half years with the Alliance, I've gained a huge amount of experience working with the members in the region, delivering campaigns, working and lobbying, and being part of the Alliance machine. So actually, I understand a lot of what the Alliance is already about. And it's also given me a perspective that perhaps otherwise I wouldn't have. And previous to working for the Alliance, I set up my own company with two other colleagues. So I have a lot of business uh, experience, which will help me develop the Alliance strategy as, as we move forward. You come from a hunting background. I believe you've been um, hunting from about the age of nine. Is it all going to be about repealing the 2004 Hunting Act? Or are you going to be tackling wider issues such as rural post offices, bovine TB, badgers, etc.? What exactly is your manifesto? Well, obviously, the Hunting Act and getting repeal of the Hunting Act is hugely important. That is the backbone of what the Alliance has been doing over the last five years. But that's not the only story. The Alliance campaigns on issues as diverse as um, lead shot to the rearing of uh, game birds through to, as you mentioned, saving your local post office, championing uh, local uh, businesses, supporting our farmers. There's a whole plethora of areas that we are very keen to engage in. And basically, through campaigning and education, reunite British people back with their countryside. Now, in regards to tackling the Hunting Act, some people might say, do you really want to rock the boat? Yes, the Hunting Act's not working, but perhaps it's best to leave it alone. What would you say to them? Do you think this legislation needs to be repealed? Absolutely. This legislation has failed every test it's been set. The police know it's failed, the courts know it's failed, country people know it's failed. The only right thing to do is to address it and get it repealed. It's the brave and right thing to do and it will right a great wrong. Those people who say that it's not necessary, that it's simply rocking the boat, simply don't know how it must feel on a cold morning at five o'clock to have a knock on the door from the police saying down to, down to the police station and, and go for questioning. I mean, what a horrific situation we are asking those people who work uh, for our local hunts to be in. Now, in regards to tackling the hunting acts, have you got a timetable for that? I think that we shouldn't be too uh, presumptuous about um, setting a timetable for the coalition government. However, it does need to be tackled and it needs to be tackled in this parliament. But considering the state of the economy and the serious cuts that we're about to face as a country, I think it's hugely important that both countryside people and urban people um, can see that the government is addressing very serious um, issues that affect all our lives, whether you live or work in the countryside or whether you live or work in the town. Rural poverty is, is a pretty key issue, actually. How, how can we cushion the blows that will be dealt in, in the new cuts that are coming? Well, I think it's very important that we talk to government um, about how cuts will affect people in the countryside. A one-size-fits-all urban solution won't work in the countryside. That's not because we demand special treatment, but simply because if you're an older person living in an isolated area, you don't have good transport networks, you might not have local amenities. As diesel and petrol prices increase, it makes it in increasingly difficult for those people to be mobile. So you're really isolating a whole group of very vulnerable people. And it's not just the old, of course, young people who need transport to be able to get to work. It's a really serious situation which will have quite huge consequences should we not be aware of them. And I think it's our job to make sure that government realise that it's an interlinked issue. 
it's transport, it's local housing, it's schools, it's doctor surgeries. All these things need to be addressed in a way that's compassionate to those people who, who most need their help. Now, in recent years, the Countryside Alliance has become arguably more about field sports insurance. Um, and I quote, offering the best insurance package around. That's rather feeble, isn't it? I mean, do you want to be an effective pressure group or do you want to be an insurance company? I mean, surely you want to be influencing policy rather than selling them. Absolutely. We are a first-class campaigning organisation. We have a proven track record. It's what we're good at. It's why people are drawn to us. We're feisty and we're willing to take on a fight to protect and promote those people whose lives depend on their work in the countryside. But that's not to say we can't offer also great value insurance. The benefit of being with the Alliance is that your money goes, to, goes into a pot which allows us to campaign on all the issues that are important to you, but also allows you the insurance you need to be able to take part in the country pursuits that are so important to you and important to us. Now, under the tenure of um, former Chief Executive Simon Hart, the Countryside Alliance was a huge force to be reckoned with. I mean, winning Channel 4 News' political personality of the decade in 2008. How do you intend to maintain that record? Well actually I think, and Simon himself would acknowledge, that the political personality of the decade was about the Alliance as a whole, but more importantly it was about our members, it was about mobilisation, it was about the fact that the Alliance was able to uh, revive that feeling that actually people can do something about their lot. And I think that feeling, that feeling of being able to make a change is incredibly important and I definitely want to be able to carry that feeling through. The Alliance has been incredibly successful um, under Simon Hart's tenure and I hope to be able to build upon that using my vision which I think will increasingly uh, be inclusive, will we'll talk about the fact that education and campaigning can go hand in hand. I'll work with the foundation, which is the charitable arm, together with the political campaigning arm of the Alliance, can work hand in hand to deliver a better future for everybody who lives, works or wants to enjoy the countryside. Now, Alice, you are both Chief Executive of the Countryside Alliance and the Countryside Alliance Foundation. What's the difference? Well, the Countryside Alliance itself is still the feisty campaigning organisation it's always been, who's going to fight and promote uh, your rights uh, as far as field sports are concerned and wider rural issues. The Countryside Alliance Foundation is dedicated to educating and bringing the countryside to anyone who wants to learn or know about what goes on there. So whether that's the fishing for schools, um, which we've introduced, which is led by Charles Jardine, an expert fly fisherman, um, who takes it into schools and talks to children with special educational needs, gets them out on a riverbank, allows them um, to, to fulfil their potential, but also uh, brings them back into mainstream education. They have to write up reports. And again, it's about them engaging back into everyday life. That's been incredibly successful. We're going to build on that with falconry for schools, we have casting for recovery, which is something that was brought over from America, which allows women who've uh, been treated for breast cancer to go away on short retreats to both um, take part uh, with other women in the same situation, but allows them to build up muscle and stamina after their operations. Great work that we need to continue and build on. Some would say in the shooting world that the Countryside Alliance has a bias towards hunting. What would you say to those people? Well, actually, contrary to, to popular belief, of course hunting is vitally important to the Alliance. But shooting always has been, um, as is fishing and every other part of rural activities. Um, we actually have a National Shooting Week that takes place every year um, in, in April. Uh, and this is, I suppose, the, the other element, which is National Newcomers uh, Week, which allows people who haven't experience hunting, people who have horses but haven't perhaps ever been hunting, haven't uh, been engaged in that process, it gives them an opportunity to get out uh, into the countryside, meet people who hunt, find out what goes on, have a go and if they enjoy it of course they'll be part of, of hunting communities for the future which I think is a really important thing. Now Alice, rather like Simon Hart, you were an internal appointment. 
Isn't that rather controversial, or was the position offered outside? Well, I don't think it's controversial. The post was advertised externally uh, in the Sunday Times, um, and they used headhunter, a firm of headhunters uh, for the selection process. So it was open and available to whoever wanted to apply. I think in my case, um, and it's hard to, to make this, uh, this assessment when you're on the other side of the table, but my feeling is that uh, they were attracted to my experience both uh, with the Countryside Alliance already, the fact that I have a lot of inbuilt knowledge and I know a lot of people that I'll con be continuing to work with, but also I have a very solid business background. And ultimately, the Alliance um, has got lots of challenges um, as we move forward and they felt that they were leaving the Alliance in safe hands by appointing me. Now Alice also like Simon Hart, you're involved with the Tory party. Um, Simon Hart is now um, the Conservative MP for Carmarthen West and South Pembrokeshire. And earlier this year, you were shortlisted as a prospective parliamentary candidate for the Conservatives for Stratford-upon-Avon. Is the Countryside Alliance just a platform to kickstart your career? Absolutely not. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the process um, and it, uh, it was an incredibly useful learning curve for me. Being appointed as Chief Executive absolutely satisfies my political ambitions at the moment. And my focus is absolutely and wholeheartedly on the Alliance. This is not a stepping stone to, to something bigger and better. This is about um, the opportunity to drive forward the Alliance, to reconnect people back with their countryside and it's something I'm really relishing the opportunity to do. But isn't it unwise for the Countryside Alliance to be seen as a provisional wing of the Conservative Party? I mean you have Kate Hoey as chairman but it's a very kind of um, Tory feel, you know, has a very Tory feel to the organisation. Well I think that's a media perspective but I don't think that's actually the case. As you say, Kate Hoey, our chairman, is a uh, an incredibly well-respected Labour MP, uh, Baroness Malinu, who's our president, uh, another uh, Labour peer. We are very fortunate to have backing from across the political spectrum. Um, clearly, uh, it has been the case that in the past people have suggested that somehow uh, we, our links are, are close with the Conservative Party. That's not the case. What we do know is that uh, at a time like this, when a coalition has made statements on various issues concerning the countryside, that they are listening and that they are keen to engage back with the countryside. So we need to take advantage of that situation and make sure that our voice is heard. But that's not about becoming cosy with them or, um, or infiltrating or trying to exert pressure beyond our, um, our remit. This is about getting things done. Now, Alice, just on a final note, how muddy are you on a scale of one to ten? I mean, how much of a pavement person versus how much of a kind of country person are you? And also, why do you care so much about the countryside, rural communities and field sport? Well, on the question of mud, then I'm probably up there as a nine. Um, you know, if, at the weekends when I'm not working, then I'm mucking out my horses or I'm hunting or I'm walking my dogs or my hand puppies. I think doing this job, it's really important to still be part of what you're representing. And it's incredibly important to me that I am part of my small community here in Leicestershire, that I'm part of the community of dairy farmers and um, I'm part of a network of people who really care what happens to the countryside as we move forward. Uh, the opportunity to serve the Alliance um, is a great one. Uh, I think everything to do with the Alliance um, has a, has a certain uh, ring of the heart sometimes rather than the head. I think that it's a passion that you feel sort of almost deep within you that drives you forward, that makes you feel you can really make a difference. And in this day and age, it's so rare for people to really feel that they still have the power to make change. And we really have that, but as a team, as a group moving forward. Alice Barnard, Chief Executive of the Countryside Alliance. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now Mike Yardley continues his series on game shooting. This week he's in London at William Evans to look at the history of the shotgun.
Well, here I am in one of my favourite places, the gun room at William Evans in London. And I want to talk a little bit about the history of guns and the history of shooting. Roughly speaking, birds have been shot with guns in these islands for about 500 years. There's a reference to birding, probably with guns in the Merry Wives of Windsor. It's a fascinating story. And before we shot guns at birds, we were shooting birds with bows and arrows, and we were shooting them with crossbows. And that's relevant because the trigger mechanism of the crossbow actually became part of that crude gun mechanism, the matchlock, which predated the snap haunts and the, the wheel lock and the other early gun locks. The matchlock was a very crude device. It was really just a serpentine with a piece of saltpeter impregnated hemp that dropped into a pan that was next to a touch hole in the barrel. You pulled the trigger, that dropped the serpentine into the pan and the gun went off, but there was a lot of delay. Rich sportsmen on the continent developed something else. Maybe Leonardo was responsible, we're not quite sure. There's some sketches that suggest he might have been. This was the so-called wheel lock gun, where you had, you wound it up, it was a clockwork mechanism, and it had a hammer which fell onto a, ro a revolving wheel, and in the jaws of the hammer was a piece of iron parietes, and that created sparks, and those sparks then ignited the charge and the gun fired. The next development, though, were those mechanisms that involved flint and steel. Famously, the flintlock, this is a later type flintlock, made by the most famous gun maker of all, Joe Manton, the man who taught Purdy, amongst many others. An absolutely super, super thing. It's from my own collection. I'm very proud to have something made by that great master of gun making. And here you had a piece of flint in the jaws. It would come and fall onto that metal part here. The pan would open up, the sparks would be created, and the gun would fire. And that made shooting birds on the wing much easier than previously. After that, the story gets even more intriguing. In the early 1800s, a Scottish cleric, Alexander Forsyth, wanted to go wildfowling in the wet. The problem was, he knew that there were compounds, metallic fulminates, which the alchemists had experimented with. Compounds that if you hit them, compounds of gold and silver that would explode. Now, the French had tried it. French military scientists had tried to apply this technology to their own military weapons, and they'd blown up. But Forsyth thought, no, I'm not going to use this as a propellant. I'm going to use it as a detonating compound. So he developed the percussion system. Initially, it involved a powder of fulminate. It was made into pills, into caps, and then eventually into a percussion cap, which is much like the primer of a modern cartridge. And indeed, it's very significant for that reason, because although percussion guns came in from about the 18, um, well, the 1810s, and certainly guns involving uh, percussion caps on the nipples um, from the 1820s or thereabouts, and they were much more efficient, less, less affected by rain, and also there was less delay when you pulled the trigger, um, the hammer fell, ignited the um, detonator, the, onto the charge, and the shot came out the barrels. The delay was reduced, the time lag was reduced, and again that made shooting on the wing all the easier. But the big thing about the percussion cap was that it created the possibility for the self-contained cartridge. And in the 1830s in France, they started experimenting. In fact, Pauli was experimenting, an artilleryman of Napoleon's before that, but Casimir Lafosha started experimenting with a pinfire gun, which is this rod which goes down into a percussion cap, strikes the percussion cap, and ignites the charge. And he brought that system. There were certain complications. He had to sort out gas leakage and other problems. He brought that system to the UK, and he brought that to England to the Great Exhibition in the 1850s, and it was amazingly influential at the Crystal Palace. All the English gun makers went to look at it. People were much impressed. He sold quite a few guns. But soon after, Lancaster came out with his base fire system, and not long after that, we had cartridges very like modern ones. It also meant that you could have 
a breech-loading gun. So that one little invention leads not just to the self-contained cartridge, but to the breech-loading gun, the repeating rifle, the automatic rifle, the machine gun, and ultimately to the carnage in the trenches. So it was an extraordinarily important invention. But from a sporting point of view, it meant that the development of the shotgun really accelerated. Here we've got a hammer gun, it's a William Evans 10-bore hammer gun with Jones's rotary underlever and it's got Stanton's locks. And so this, this system, the rotary underlever, is a very strong system, not quite as neat as the Scott spindle perhaps, but very strong. And although it um, became redundant on shotguns probably in the 1880s and 90s, it was kept sometimes for rifles because of its strength. This gun's also interesting because it has Stanton's locks. The early type of hammer gun would have had locks which went to half cock and then full cock. But these are to Stanton's patent and they hold off the firing pin for safety. A very important development in its time, but quickly superseded by box locks and by side lock guns. Here's a delightful little 410 and it's made on Anson and Dealey's um, action, the classic box lock action, called a box lock action, because the works are contained within the box of the action. The side lock gun was developed really in the 1880s. Most famously, Frederick Beasley, who used to have a shop very close to where we are now, developed a, a gun which looked in profile much like this beautiful William Evans gun. He sold the design for his gun to Purdy's and it became their famous side lock. Soon after that, Holland and Holland developed their royal gun. It went through various stages and it was profoundly influential too, as, as was the Purdy gun. And then other great makers like William Evans started to make these supremely beautiful classic English side lock sporting guns. And really, this technology was evolved to its peak before 1900. And the guns that we make today are really little different to those guns made more than 100 years ago. We haven't been able to improve it. Double triggers, of course, the single trigger mechanism was also being developed at the same time, but goes back much earlier. But reliable single triggers really date to um, about 1900. Another important development, the constriction at the end of the barrels, so-called choke. Big battle here between Mr. Pape and Mr. Greener. Mr. Pape was awarded a cup for being the inventor of choke. He wasn't. My own researches suggest, in fact, that choke is an ancient, um, an ancient discovery. But Greener popularised choke in Britain, probably having seen the choke bore guns doing so well in gun trials in the US, and taking the idea from US gun makers who'd been developing it in the 19th century, bringing it to the UK, and so in the 1870s, chokeboard guns became very, very fashionable. The Field, the great sporting magazine, had a trial, and that proved that the chokeboard guns beat the cylinder board guns, and everybody had to have a chokeboard gun thereafter.